I think that we can wait a couple of minutes while people join, but um, for those that are coming in, welcome to another great Backstage Fest program. Today we're talking about getting the gig. So we're here with four incredible casting directors who have a lot of great work on TV. Um, Sharon Bialy and Sherry Thomas are here out of LA and you know their work from so many things, but just a sampling, Perry Mason, The Comey Rule, Handmaid's Tale, Better Call Saul. We'll be here all day if I wanna keep listing things you've worked on. Um, Theo Park is here from probably out of the UK, I believe. Um, and she, this, most recently she's worked on Master of None, which is now streaming on Netflix and Ted Lasso. And Julie Harkin is here and she, you will know her work from HBO's Industry and I May Destroy You. So we have a great conversation in store for you today because these women have all just been in, well, this year especially, which I wanna talk about, but just, you know, actors, you have worked in all different types of genres and tones and with so many different creators. So we're gonna touch a little bit on all of those things and get some advice. Cause I know that our actor audience are eager to hear from you about what you wanna see in the audition room. But to kick us off, I know that Sharon and Sherry and Theo have all been, especially the shows that you know we're kind of here talking about, have you done a little work in quarantine? I'm not sure about you, Julie, but I want to hear a little bit about how the last year has been for you, some of the changes you've had to make to your process, kind of what actors can expect from those changes. And also what is what changes are going to stick around now that things are slowly starting to open up and resume a version of normalcy? So anyone can start. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll start. Um, I, uh, if we are an alpha by last name, um, <laughs> it is very different since um, COVID because we were all um, out of work for five months. And then when things came back, it was solely self tapes. And we're, we have always done a lot of self taping because Sherry and I on all of our shows will cast from all over the United States, often all over the world. So we have a history of doing that. However, we love to be in the room with actors. That's where it's exciting and that's where you can play and find some new things with people. So that's what's really different about COVID and we miss it, but it has been working and we've been casting and we've done tests on Zoom and we're all figuring it out. I do think that we'll have a hybrid going forward. I think we will be continuing the self tape it does save a lot of time for certain producers not to drive across town, et cetera. But I do also think that nothing replaces being in the room. And when we get to the you know larger roles, there will be people who will want to be back in the room, as do we. Yeah. Um, I think too, just to your point, Sharon, it's, um, it's harder to get to know an actor as a person and which really sort of informs uh, what roles, you know, are really suited for them in addition to, you know, the work that they can do as an actor. And it's just more fun, you know? And I think it's even, you can see it here with us doing this panel. It's, it's really challenging. Like, am I going to jump on someone? Am I going to interrupt someone? Am I going to, you know, who, it, you know, it's a lot of that. So you just kind of have to get through all of that crap and make it as um, normal as possible. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I've been having to rely on my memory more than usual because um, you want to, when you're working on a show now, you have to try and, you know, make sure that you're casting people that you know are really right for the part that you've met a lot of times that you've, you've, you've worked with. And so, you know, their range properly and um, there's less chance at the moment to just throw the doors open and bring in load whole and new people and meet them and get to know them so we are getting to know people on self-tapes which is fun and people are doing fantastic self-tapes really going above and beyond yeah. what what is required and I'm every day I'm constantly impressed with the, the the effort that people have gone to but yeah it's not quite the same as being in a room and getting to know someone 
Yeah, um, I would say that I, I find it find it a real real challenge in time because um, I I mean I I've had the joy of working on a lot of shows over the years where I have to create a cast like a young cast um, like Industry or Misfits or Utopia and we would you know do a lot of workshops and a lot of impro with young actors and experienced actors and we would get them in in groups in 10 and we would spend an hour with them and we would do lots of drama games and get everybody relaxed and and then you know let people be free around the subjects in the show rather and then we would introduce script later and all of that has gone and we um I say we, me, me and my team here in my office, we've cast quite a few shows this year with young adults and it's been, it's been really sad not being able to, to cast in our normal way. And, um, and like everybody else is saying, you know, you, you, don't, you, just, you don't get to know somebody well enough over a tape or a Zoom. You know, it's just that, you know, that, that, that chemistry that, you know, you, someone's soul that you get when you're standing with them and eye contact. And um, so I, I've, I've certainly found challenging during these COVID times, um, a bit of a struggle in those instances, but we're also lucky to, to be in an industry that's so busy and, and everyone's working so much and, and, and very grateful for that at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the craft of acting is wanting to connect and be human with each other. And then the craft of casting is wanting to collaborate and bring that together. So we also want to connect and be with people in a real way, you know? So I agree with you, Julie. Yeah. But we're all casting, what we're casting right now, all through self-tapes or Zoom, and it, we're making it work. Um, I know Sherry and I, like within treatment, after we saw the, some of the final contenders, we would just get on a Zoom and talk to them because we so missed being in a room with them. And yeah. we always try to provide an asshole free set so that everybody can focus on the work. We make that promise. So, you know, we took a long time talking to these young actors that we had never met before. You know, um, it was mostly people we had never met before as we were searching for the young people. Um, and that was fun. And you, we just, you know, you work longer hours, I think, as a casting director now, because you're watching self-tapes all night long. And as Theo said, if you don't know them, you can't spend a long time talking to everybody. So we've been looking at people's work so that we could have a sense of their range. So There's no division of time. You just go. Yeah. You just, like, wake up, get on the computer, and then you take a break, and then you go back, and you get it. it. Yeah. It is working. And I think to Theo's point, we're, or I think it was Julie, we're very, very fortunate that our business is going full steam ahead right now. Yeah. And speaking of self-tapes, one of the viewers wanted to know that I mean, you had mentioned already, Sharon, that you were seeing people from all over the country and all over the world a lot of times when you were casting, even before the pandemic. But especially now that things have been more limited to Zooms and self-tapes, I'm, I'm curious for all of you, does that, has that made you a little bit more flexible on where you're willing to accept self-tapes from? Maybe something that was previously going to be a little bit more local. Are you now a little bit you know, have you expanded the radius a little bit? Tell you what's the challenge. I tell you what's the challenge actually here. I don't know if it's the same in, in the US. I, I suspect it is, is that in actual fact, no, because we need people to be based as close to the yeah. production as possible because of COVID testing. Um, uh, the productions obviously have really strict, um, route, you know, regimes of how they test artists before and it's, you know, and if I book an actor who's in Scotland, who's not due down until to shoot until, you know, Thursday, but they, we, we need to test him twice. It's, 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 re, it's actually really complicated. So definitely self tapes, we can self tape whoever they are in the world, but actually production wise, it's quite tricky to book someone who is not close to production, especially on day player roles where we're not able to just, you know, bring them down and put them in a hotel for, for two weeks. Okay. <clears throat> And we do The Handmaid's Tale, which shoots in Canada. So, you know, and we were shooting and they had a two week quarantine or was it four weeks? It was really long. So then we would bring in actors, um, you know, for some of the smaller roles and it was great. And we couldn't do that at the end of the season. It was just, 
you know, a three week quarantine for uh, somebody who is working two days and those two days could be an important role, but we just couldn't do it. The quarantine was two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. And I also want to expand on something else you said, Sharon, you said you try to ensure an asshole free set. <laughs> and I th I've heard that from a lot of casting directors. <laughs> oh, um, and I, you, you mentioned you'd want, you know, you do that by just talking to people. So I think it's interesting for actors to know that you can have the best audition ever, but if you're maybe not, well, in previous times, if you're not nice to someone in the uh, waiting room or there's something that comes through that there's might, there might be a problem that maybe then despite their great audition, they, they're not going to get the part. Can all of you talk a little bit more about that too? Because I think that there's been a little bit more awareness of this in the industry. And I think that it's important for actors to know that their talent is important, but it's not the only thing that casting directors are looking for. Yeah, be nice to everybody, especially the assistants, because someday the assistants become the casting directors and we have long memories. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just how you should be living your life. Be kind, be good, be real, be honest. And also if you, innately are not a good person our job is to see the truth in people even when they're performing so guess what we're going to see the bullshit and we're going to know so <laughs> just you know just be a good person it's really easy <laughs> yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense um and another someone Theo, you were talking about self tapes and how you've seen a lot of people be really innovative, especially during this time on self tapes when that's pretty much your only option. Can you describe maybe, I know everything is different. Every project's different. Every actor is different. Some things that might work for someone would be a little bit too much for someone else. But I guess the best you can, can you give some examples of things that have stuck out to you on self tapes? Um, yeah, I was casting like this short film um, and we needed some cyclists and, you know, this, this guy, I mean, a few of them did, but this one guy who got the part just like <laughs> took, took his bike out to the forest and like shot the whole scene with another camera and a friend and they were on their bikes together and it was, you know, doing tricks and it was unbelievable. And I did say to the director, I said, look, if we don't give this man the part, I quit. <laughs> because I can't think of anyone better than this person. I was so impressed. He was brilliant. I love that. When I, I did um, War and Peace for the BBC a few years ago with Paul Dano and James Norton and Lily James, and we had to cast Napoleon. And I, I had a lot of French actors tape on horses with full costume in a forest. Amazing. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you have to do that all the time. You don't. Uh, but I you would don't. say there are a lot of actors who um, may not have had somebody to be able to read with them and they'll pre-tape the other person's lines. It really mm. isn't a good idea because the timing is off and you're just waiting for that to come. So if you can help it, don't. You're, I actually think you're better off if you don't have somebody to come in the room actually have them on the computer like we are right now and read the lines with you and then you just record yourself. It really, really helps to have a live person and it doesn't work. I've had actors, actually the older ones who aren't as used to um, self-taping, not do the other character's lines. So they just do their lines and nobody's ever gotten a job that way. So I think the last thing to look out for. I think the last show we did where we were in the room honestly was we were finishing up Perry Mason and people would come in in the period and for every role top to bottom um and then we just did um a show for MRC and Apple called The Shrink Next Door based on the podcast and again it was period and you know top to bottom people really were just they have their setups I'm very impressed they've got you know like even if it's just a wall or they're in their closet um and it's the, everything came in just solid, professional, um, very easy to see the work without a lot of gobbledygook. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's helpful for people to know what works, but also kind of like a few of you said, what might not work or might be a little bit distracting because 
it is it can be isolating and as no matter how many self tapes you do you know it's always nice to know what they can do to improve them because it doesn't seem like they're going to be going and going away anytime yeah. soon yeah and i don't know about you guys but um I, you know actors will reach out that we're friendly with over email and say look I, this isn't going away what do you think should i up and get like a full room in my house if i can or you know I don't think it takes a lot of money. I think if you can have a space with a blank wall and a, you know, good recording device, um, a light, it, it will work. Light. And light, yeah. yeah. I don't want people to feel like they have to run out and buy all of this equipment because it's it's expensive and it's hard. And um, it just make it still be about the work that we can see what the work is. And I, I noticed in some of the questions, some people say, do you care what color the wall is? No. Like the way we have pictures right now and all of us have stuff in the background, don't do that. Because, um, you know, if you're a little ADD, your attention goes somewhere else and it should be on the actor who's auditioning. So I think it's important just to keep a blank wall and the window not behind you because you start looking around. Uh, somebody asked if we're really casting older actors. Um, I can say Sherry and I do a lot because we do Better Call Saul. So there are a lot of older actors in that. And I think in, um, I think that's changing and there are more roles for older act actors as there are more diverse actors being given opportunities. And Sharon, you mentioned earlier that um, during the casting process in quarantine, you know, you had been talking to actors that you had never met before, you'd never worked with before. Were you, how are you mainly seeing these actors? Were they mainly through agent and manager submissions? Were any, were any of them through any other means? Um, I'd say 92% are from breakdowns. And we look at all the breakdowns. It doesn't matter what agent you're from. Sherry and I have done that for 20 years. We kind of divide and conquer and go through, you know, we'll get 2000 submissions. I'm sure so do Theo and Julie, you know, so we go through them all. And we're constantly meeting with new people, um, especially, you know, even with older people and younger people, the people who have left. I don't, if somebody leaves to have, raise children and they had a lot of good work when they're 20s and they come back in their 50s, I'm not going to hold that against them. They made a choice in their life, you know. Yeah, I think that's nice to hear. And I know that's something that's different, speaking of representation and you know, experience, something that's different in the US and the UK is the importance of drama school. I don't know if this is still correct, but for each of you, how how much does the fact that someone went to drama school impact, you know, their chances of getting a part or the chances that you'll call them in or, you know, them being on your radar at all? It doesn't bother me. It's, there's certainly some projects where the creatives are interested in people who have a classical training for example for reasons of the, the material itself or whatever um and so i may seek out those people but generally it doesn't bother me whether you've trained or not it's you know whether you whether you're right for the part yeah, um, a lot of people ask about like what you include in a slate. And I think these days it's important to include where you normally live and where you currently are. Because if, if we have to travel you, we need to know how many days before, depending on the state that they're filming in, what the requirement is for, you know, from the COVID safety team. Exactly. That's and really, really, nice, really you know, important. To have a sense of humor. Like that I had an actor the other day you know, we, we needed a full body slate and he was in his little apartment. So he jumped up on the table and had his wife follow him. He goes, this is the only place you can see that I'm six foot four. <laughs> you know, so if you love what you're doing and you love acting, I think the joy of it all can come out in the slate if, if it's warranted. That's nice to hear. And there was some that, someone that asked, what's the likelihood of just getting cast of the self tape and I'm gonna guess that all of you at some point have done that where you've seen someone on a self tape or maybe I guess in the last year on zoom and you haven't seen them in person. 
They're yeah. all getting cast off a yeah. self tape. Every single oh, person is getting okay. cast off a self tape. Yeah, everything is now. That's that's our lives right now. Yeah. I mean, I think the question is, even if we've never met them before, and the answer is yes. Even if we've never met you before, you it, and we see the self tape and we feel you're best for the part. Yes. Yeah. And I, I just hope for the best. I did that before <laughs> too, as well, though. I'm sure everybody did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, even before COVID, yeah. Sometimes you'd get like this slam dunk self slam dunk self tape and you'd be like, Whoa, the he's amazing. And then everyone would, would agree and then that's it. They've got the part. They don't even need to meet. That's it. That's it. Um, I think for the European actors who are self taping for something that's filming in the United States, it would be helpful to say I have a current O-1 visa or I've never had an O-1 visa or I had an O-1 visa and it expired because that changes how much time you need to cast somebody in advance. And I know that now, even though you can get the visas to come, the embassies are all, you know, backed up. So people are having a hard time getting into America. <coughs> so I would say um, just state it so that if you've never had an O-1 visa, we know that we need six weeks. And you know, if somebody really wants you for the part, they're gonna schedule your, your, you know, if it's a feature, they're gonna put you towards the end just to give themselves a little cushion. And always tell the truth about that stuff. Passports, location, visas, like don't, 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 don't tell us a lie about it because you think you might not get the part of you, you know, just be, be honest. Cause if we know we can fix it, if we know in advance, it's easier to fix. And on a less logistical side of trying to audition for a role that maybe if you're a UK actor and you're auditioning or a European actor in general, auditioning for an American project where the characters are American or you're an American actor auditioning for something in the UK, someone was wondering, should they go in with their natural accent or should they audition with the accent of the character? Do you, does it, it is it a, big deal to you either way or does it depend on the person i would always want someone to speak in their natural accent because again it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about getting to know someone i think it depends on the part for us honestly there are some roles where um it doesn't matter and we can um educate the creative team on the actor and then they can decide, you know, it's good to know if they can do an American accent, if in fact the producers say, no, it's gotta be an American accent. So I think it just depends on the part. Sometimes what can help is just sl the slate as at the top of your self tape is, you know, that black card with white, you know, your name on it and your rep. And then let's say you have to do an American accent and you're not from America and that's not <laughs> accent. So you just go right into the scene so they can just really buy into the character. And then when you slate at the end, go to your natural accent so that they weren't distracted and they were like, wow, well, that was incredible. I had no idea they were from you know, England or I had no idea they were from Australia. So that, that might be a good thing to do on a self tape. And on kind of a further down the spectrum of, you know, I would say an accent is a version of a special skill, but someone had a good, question about other special skills. And as casting directors, Theo, you, I mean, we know for Ted Lasso, people had to have some kind of soccer slash football, no <laughs> depending where you're from, um, skill. And you just mentioned that someone sending in a self tape with, as a cyclist and going and, you know, showing a bunch of skills. In your experience, are there certain skills that are more helpful for actors to have or that really stick out on a resume than others or do you just recommend having any additional skills that make them stand out well, i guess it depends on what you're looking for um but i i don't know if generally people need to be sword fighters <laughs> um but yeah it just de it depends on exactly what you're looking for but yeah for ted lasso obviously they all had to play football very well. Uh, that was fun looking for them. <laughs> yeah. Is that something that you? Um... Oh, kudos to you, Theo. I awesome. loved that show. Oh, I that... loved the casting. I think I was your like PR person in terms of telling <laughs> everybody they had to watch this show. 
Um, it was like, I, it came like, Karen. <laughs> it came along at the right time, and I thought the casting was superb. Oh, thank, thanks yeah. so much. <laughs> Is that something that you know? You said they had to be able to play pretty well. Is that something that you could tell that someone was kind of, you know, maybe lying a little bit about how well they could play? Like, could you tell that during auditions? Well, we put them through their paces. We asked them to all do audition tapes showing us their football skills. I'm not a football expert. So I, I just sent everything across and said, look, these are their skills. You decide because, you know, then it wasn't down to me. I mean, I could tell them, I could tell that I could push them for their acting ability, but I wasn't completely sure. But, you know, when you get an amazing take like Cristo Fernandez, who plays Danny Rojas, he, he, he was actually a pro footballer. <laughs> His take was like unbelievable. It was so, I mean, it was ri ridiculously good. His football, he'd, he'd gone to so much effort. <laughs> so um, you, it was kind of very clear that he could, that he could do it. Um, but then I think with Phil Dunster, who we part, cast as Jamie Tart. The creative said to me, oh, it doesn't matter too much if Jamie Tart isn't a good, a, a good footballer. And I remember saying to Phil in, in his eye, and, and, and tell me, how are your football skills? And he was like, yeah, 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 I can play football. And I was always like, oh my God, I hope he can. But as it turns out, he, he's pretty good. <laughs> so, Because I was worried, they weren't. And as it turns out, he's, he's a pretty good footballer. <laughs> but everybody else had to do a proper skills tape. Yeah. Okay. I just I think it's good to be prepared for if you're if you're in a show that has some kind of specialty like that, you you know you got to show us yeah, yeah. you got to show us exactly like like riding on a horse for for Julie. <laughs> oh yes, I feel like there was um mm -hmm. there were some jokes in Friends where Joey would lie about his skills and then have to show them, and I feel like that's one of the more realistic aspects of being an actor is mm -hmm. you have to do it if you're going to list it. Oh, uh -huh. I've got a tip. I've got a tip. If you ever, as an actor, read a script that you're going up for and you're driving in the script, fess up if you don't have a driving license. <laughs> yeah. um, it probably happens more in the UK than it happens. I'm sure everyone in America I drives. Was say, but... LA, I don't really think we deal with that, but it has to be maybe one that's valid and hasn't been taken away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, I mean, it's obviously it's our casting director's responsibility to, to, you know, make sure that everyone's driving. But if you, if you just please, please, if you're, if you can't drive, tell us. In LA, that definitely would not come up, but in New York, it might be more of an issue. Yeah. Um, it comes up in London, like actors, just loads of them just don't drive weirdly in London. Or, I suppose. The like, actors here just don't drive. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> But that is funny. So I also wanted to ask because all of you have a, have experience kind of straddling genres, whether a project you've worked on is kind of like a hybrid of genres or you, you know, you've done dramas, you've done comedies. And I'm curious if you can speak to the differences between casting those two types of shows or if there are big differences between casting a comedy and a drama. And is there a difference in, you know, the type of talent you're looking for? Is there a difference in the way that you run auditions? I'm just curious because now with so many, there's so many projects and so many things that are, you know, kind of, they might be both or they, you know, there's just so much work out there in TV and you see more and more that actors are kind of doing both genres more than maybe in the past. So I'm curious about how, what the casting process is behind that. I think even in comedy, it's different. So you have, you know, for us, um, Barry, you know, which is a single camera, comedy, dark, um, where improv is um, still really, really welcome. Where Danny McBride's, um, tone and uh, on the righteous gemstones is very improv based and then we make sure that within that they can also do a straight take and still make it funny and grounded um so even within the comedy space and then there's dead to me which is also um single camera 
but the tone of it is a little bit more straight. And then it's the behavior within the scenes that make it funny, also Linda and Christina. Um, so even within that, I feel like sometimes I, you know, um, I'm auditioning the same person for all three of these shows and then they finally get one of them because it was sort of like the perfect, you know, the perfect fit. I think improv is the hardest thing to do now over Zoom. I don't like it. It's really hard because that so much of that is about just really being in a room with somebody and listening and playing with them, you know, and um, we're good at it. I think we have to be in our job, but we're not skilled in a way to know really how to make it work over Zoom. So you're trying to give and, and keep up over Zoom with, with improv actors that are very, very skilled in it. Um, but as far as actors, don't ever let anybody tell you, you can only do drama, you can only do comedy. Um, just so you know, that, that happened to Sherry and I for years, we could not get a comedy. We were the edgy people who did Reggae Band, and, you know, or whatever. And uh, we went on meetings to try to get comedies and they were like, no. So we just kept putting comedians in Breaking Bad as our <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> and honestly, I think it was Danny McBride that changed everything and gave yeah. a shot and said, yeah. yeah. So sometimes even for an actor, it just takes one person, one casting director to, to just say, yeah. They like, can do both. They can do both. <laughs> of course, of course. I, it's funny, in my mind, whether I'm casting comedy or drama, I'm, com I'm casting comedy. <laughs> because I only like casting comedy. <laughs> so I put it in my mind, I pretend it's a comedy. <laughs> I like that. It would probably make us all a little happier. We should try that on Handmaid's Tale, Sharon. Right, <laughs> we're weeping all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's not. We we tend to cry during those auditions. It's it's uh. distracting. Oh no. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Theo. It's interesting because you have you know Ted Lasso is a certain type of comedy, and then Master of None is a more subtle type of comedy. And I know you just did that, so it's um. I just try and crowbar comedians in wherever I can. Let's try and get them in. <laughs> and of course, I know that a lot of our viewers are curious and hopeful. You know, a lot of people, especially those who were just trying to get into the industry in the last year, year and a half, and then they had this crazy shutdown and now everything is kind of different and people had to change their processes. So I'm curious how you have discovered new people outside of you know an agent or a manager that you're you're familiar with sending you someone especially during this time when we've all been at home and maybe had more time to watch things than we had in the past is there any way that is that a, that you recommend people who don't have a ton of a ton of work on their resume or don't have a ton of professional stuff on their reel that they what any recommendations for what they can do to kind of put work out there that you m might come across? That's hard. Yeah, I think, I mean, you have had actors that are making their own content. I mean, take a page from Michael Sheen and David Tennant. If you haven't seen their show, it is the funniest thing in the world. And they just were bored at home, you know? So I think you can do that and post it places, but I think it is really hard. I think we, you know, nor in times of and it's coming back I you know we go to the theater and that's how we see new people and we watch a lot of other television but it was really in the theater that you would find people who were new and hadn't done television before so I think that actors have suffered this year because of that especially you know newer actors who were transitioning into trying to get television and film work um but you you know people can create their own content and they throw it up on different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, and that's a lot of, <clears throat> I found during the pandemic, there's so much of it, Every it's yeah. everyone's getting really creative and, um, and people are getting loads of followers on social media for their tapes and people are getting famous from just doing stuff online. So that's, yeah, just um, take a leaf out of their books and yeah, go for it and just start, yeah self-promoting i think it's encouraging that for people to hear that you see those things because um as much as it's you know 
it's nice to create. And if you have, if you're creative and you are a performer, you know, you can do this and maybe it seems like you're doing it into a vacuum if you're, especially if you're doing it at home alone. So um, I think it's nice for performers to hear that you, uh, that you do in fact <laughs> see what they're creating. I think we're all on social media. We're all either on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And we all know someone who knows someone and however the algorithms are, it ends up on our page. So if there, I always will, you know, click on, um, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend who posted, you know, a scene, a video, a short film, you know, um, something funny that they did on TikTok. So it's just about, you know, Brian Cranston said it a long, 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 long time ago. If you want to be an actor, be an actor. If you want to be an actor, act anywhere go through the drive through at burger king or wherever it is you're going and do an accent or be a character like it's if you want to be famous that's a different thing if you want to be an actor an artist somebody who is really honing their craft that's a different thing in my opinion and we have to start wrapping things up and but someone asked a question that was for all of you what do you find to be the most enjoyable thing about being a casting director? And what's one of your favorite roles or projects that you've worked on that's been enjoyable for you as a casting director? Mm -hmm. You have to pick one. Yeah, that's like Sophie's choice. That's really hard. <laughs> your favorite baby child. <laughs> Who's your favorite kid? Um, yeah. You don't have to choose. You can just, you can stick with what you like about being a casting director if, you, if it's too hard to choose. I think for me, the best part of the job is about the job. The reason I do it is people, you know, and uh, um, I'm from Ireland. <coughs> and if you, if you have been guessed by the accent by now, but um, our, our culture is storytelling and uh, just being a, a part of an industry where the heart of it all is storytelling and, and getting to be a part of that process is like the whole reason I'm in it, that and the people. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if I could pick one of my shows for, to be the favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I feel bad. I feel guilty. Yeah. It's different than having a favorite show as an audience member. Mm. It's a little bit more involved. I think all of us get an absolute, it's just joyful when you champion an actor and they get the part. There's something so amazing about that feeling or watching someone get their first big job. Um, it's, it's an emotional thing for us too. I mean, it's part of the artistry of casting. And when it all comes together and you see the person who you believed in, even if you never knew that person, but you believe they were the best one for the job and they get the job, it's 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 emotional for us too. I mean, we're not doing that, you know, if, if it wasn't emotional and personal, we would have gone and become bankers. Yeah, I think that's right, Sharon. It's the artistry of casting. And that might be my favorite part of the job is when you are recognized for your art, when someone on the team you know, actually recognizes that what you are doing is art and and part of very much part of the creative per creative process. And we're not just secretaries. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, when, when, you, when, when you get that recognition, that's that's a real buzz. Yeah, I think it's about the storytelling and the collaboration. Um, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody one time and I said, I just feel like I don't do enough in terms of you know, philanthropic activity. And it makes me feel bad. And, and you know, and, and I was talking about work and, and sort of how, where does the time go? And I was donate to the things that I can donate to, but in terms of my time. And she said, I just want you to stop and think about something for a second, because she's you know, is aware of the business. And she said, you are, you are an activist for people who need jobs and love what they do. And I was like, Wow, and I'm not saying that that lets me off the hook for philanthropic work at all, but I do think all of us here are activists. We love what we do and we, um, we take pride in it and we try to change people's lives in one way or another. And that is um, very, very fulfilling, not in an egomaniac way, but in a collaborative, <clears throat> um, we love what we do, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it way, you know? Yeah, I think that definitely comes through that. And I think that it's a good thing to remind actors that you're there to be their advocates. And that has definitely come through this whole conversation, but especially in the last few minutes. And 
that's unfortunately all we have time for. Thank you so, so much to Sharon, Sherry, Theo, and Julie for taking the time to share some of your wisdom. We could be here forever if we, <laughs> if we uh, wanted to, because you have so much to share. But um, thank you everyone for joining and thank you again to our panelists for um, sharing your advice and your experiences. And we're very excited to keep watching the work that you do because- Thanks to everybody. Thank you, stay safe. It's nice to be on a panel with Theo and Julia. I mean, yeah. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. It's and, nice and to meet you. And Lisa, it's been lovely. Thank you very much indeed for asking us to do this. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.